I often get asked how I set up the grey gurnard and where I got the parts from, so hopefully this long overdue video will assist answering those types of questions. The base boat is of course a Mercury Quicksilver 420 aluminium hull inflatable, which means that this 4.2 metres in length. I got it to replace my previous boat, a Quicksilver 420 HD inflatable boat, which had a wooden floor above a PVC outer floor and air keel. This boat was 17 years old when the PVC glue started to fail due to age. I guess I could have kept it going another few years by re-gluing, but as it's a major time-consuming job, I didn't think it worth doing. I go to very remote places in all kinds of weather, so didn't want to risk my life with a re-glued transom which could fall off. I didn't want to sell the boat either, as I would not use it myself, so I recycled it and used a lot of the parts in a new aluminium hull boat. Although the glue in the old boat was failing, the PVC was still in good condition. I carefully cut the red PVC tubes to fit a lightweight wooden frame, which I constructed over the bow of a new boat. The PVC parts were glued with two-part PVC glue for full strength. To attach the red bow cover to the new boat, I cut dumbbell shapes of black PVC, folded them in half and glued them together, before gluing them onto the grey tubes. The red cover was then laced to those black dumbbell shapes with paracord. By careful placement and colour coordinating the parts, I think it looks quite a professional job. It's been in position now for three years, been towed hundreds of miles behind the car and been through even more miles in rough seas and still looks as good as the day I made it. The bow cover is not designed to keep water out of the boat. It's to keep my camping gear inside the boat when underway in less than ideal conditions. There is a built-in locker under the bow cover and I keep one of the three 25-litre fuel tanks. The other two tanks are kept midship and under my bench seat at the rear of the boat. These positions help trim the boat and allow a range of around 200 miles in my longer trips. The three tanks' fuel pipes all run to a transom and I can change tanks while underway by plugging and unplugging the fuel pipe onto the male connector above the water separator. I didn't bother with a water separator when I ran the 25 horsepower two-stroke, but feel it is a must on the new Yamaha 25 horsepower EFI four-stroke. The anchor box, which is also housed near the bow, holds a 2 kilogram plow anchor with 25 metres of rope and 4 metres of chain, plus a 1 kilogram grapnel anchor and 15 metres of rope. I carry an additional 25 metres of rope in a coil in case I want to extend the anchor rope or run a rope from the transom to land when anchored offshore by the bow. You can never have too much rope in a boat. If you wonder what the rope coming over the bow cover is for, the answer is it's the painter which is tied onto the bow ring below the tubes. It's used to anchor a boat as I obviously can't reach under the bow because of the canopy. To anchor a boat, I lower the anchor from the middle of the boat and let it out far enough to secure the bottom of the seabed, then simply tie it onto the painter's carabiner. This shows what I mean and then I let the anchor rope go completely, keeping the end of the rope in the anchor box. The boat then swings into wind and waves held by the anchor tied to the painter in a straight line which is tied to the bow eye of the boat. In other words, the end of the anchor rope is never tied to the boat, if that makes sense. To recover the anchor, I simply pull the free end of the anchor rope until the painter's carabiner comes back into the boat. I then unclip it and haul up the anchor from the middle of the boat. And job is done. The layout of my last boat evolved over the years to suit my needs perfectly, so I wanted to replicate that layout in the new boat. 
the main component being my homemade centre console, which was carefully designed for my other hobby of photography and video. I require quick access to my cameras at all times and the cameras have to be kept dry as they are not waterproof. The cameras are kept in a sheltered open shelf that facilitates this. Tiller steering also allows me a free hand to operate the cameras while steering with the other hand. Nowadays the console also houses a large 12 volt battery for the electric start outboard, the radio and other electronics which I shall cover shortly. Initially I just lifted the console and floor from the old boat, painted it grey and got it ready to install in the new boat. The problem was how to secure it to the aluminium hull, as I could not use bolts or screws of a different metal, due to non-similar metals causing corrosion. I knew the solution lay in keeping everything attached to the wooden floor from the old boat, as it was the best of marine ply and in good condition. I used Sikaflex marine adhesive to glue two painted hardwood rails to the aluminium hull. The rear of the rails were also bolted to the aluminium transom supports as they could easily insulate the bolts from the aluminium with a piece of plastic pipe between the bolt and the metal. And then it was simply a case of placing a console firmly attached to the old wooden floor into the boat and screwing it all onto the wooden rails. This method meant there were no dissimilar metals such as bolts or screws in contact with the aluminium hull. Corrosion will occur between the similar metals when immersed in salt water and it's the aluminium hull which will corrode, not the bolts or screws. For belts and braces I then drilled three holes through the front of the old wooden floor, then the aluminium floor in the new boat and tied them together with some rope, which was later replaced with extra large cable ties for a neater job. It all works well as three years later it's never moved a millimetre. I secured a couple of lifting handles from the scrap boat onto either side of the console and they are great for holding a towel to wipe fishy hands or short pieces of rope etc. I used the bench seat from the old boat too and made a red cushion from cut PVC tube glued around a garden kneeling pad. I kept the old rubber non-slip mat, so the two boats had the layout which suited me perfectly. So very little of the old boat was thrown away, and every time I go to sea, I'm still sitting among its recycle bits, which suits this sentimental seafarer, as the old boat gave me a lot of pleasure and pleasant memories. To secure the transducer to the transom, and also make a suitable mount for the auxiliary outboard, I cut some scrap pieces of the old floorboard to fit the shape of the transom, painted them red to match the rest of the boat trim, and it works perfectly. Sycaflexed and secured by the large towing U-bolts, which are again shielded from the aluminium with plastic pipe. The transducer is on a homemade slide so it can be raised or lowered to prevent damage when landing. This photograph shows the auxiliary outboard in position and there is plenty of room to keep it permanently mounted in the transom. I used a piece of the old boat's transom mount for the auxiliary mount so its clamps have something to bite onto without damaging the aluminium hull. Last year I replaced the Mariner 25 horsepower two-stroke outboard with a new 25 horsepower EFI Yamaha 4-stroke and there is still plenty of room to keep the 3.3 horsepower auxiliary attached to the transom. So that hopefully covers the basic layout of my boat with the exception of the console layout which I will now discuss. I built the original console with a plastic basin which was at its base. The idea being that the fish finder batteries would be kept dry in the console even when water was sloshing about the floor. The centre of the console kept my cameras dry, but with easy access. The top consisted of a drawer, which kept small but essential items, 
like a sharp knife, a few tools, a spare kill cord and some fishing gear. It was made from exterior grade plywood from B&Q and painted with underseal and exterior house paints. When I first got the aluminium hull boat, it was repainted to match its surroundings. Then, when I got the new Yamaha electric start outboard, I fitted all the electrics into a drawer, which worked well. The big 12-volt, 23-ampere-hour battery fitted in the basin, just. The console lasted 10 years and would have easily lasted another 10 years, but I missed having a drawer for bits and bobs. My recent camera equipment was also a tight fit, so I decided to build a slightly larger console. This time I built it with a good quality marine ply and then coated it with epoxy resin and glass cloth. I enjoyed working with these materials, but considering it costs four or five times as much to make as my last one, I personally would just use B&Q exterior grade materials in future. Marine materials cost a fortune, and if exterior grade materials are looked after, they last just as long. That's my experience anyway. Here is the finished console and I'm very happy with it. Because the outboard has a charging circuit for the 12V battery, I made full use of it by installing a fixed VHF radio with DSC and it provides GPS coordinates if required. There are two USB ports to charge the cameras, a voltage display to show the battery is charging, and also a switch for electric bilge pump which can pump out seawater while underway. A couple of isolator switches with removable keys complete the setup. So that covers the console. I hope this answers the questions of where I get the parts. They're mostly recycled and made by myself to suit my needs. Hopefully you may get some ideas from this video for your own setup, but as everyone wants different things for their boat, I appreciate my thoughts won't suit everyone. Thanks for watching, and have a very enjoyable new year of boating.